If you're here, you've had at least some level of interest in how the microbiome impacts your health. And you've probably heard about or even paid for a microbiome analysis. Welcome to another of my presentations with information you'll find nowhere else. Given the enormous potential of the microbiome, there are now a number of companies offering at-home testing. If you choose to do one of these tests at some point after sending in your fecal sample, you'll get a report. But does the report have value? And if it does, who in the world can translate this alien language? Having spent the past number of years as the head of medical education for a microbiome firm, along with many other responsibilities I had, I bring to you my expertise. In my honest and data-driven presentations, both free and as a part of my microbiome university, I provide a consolidation of information second to none, and a perspective that is a bit different, but proven to help many people. So let's dive into the world of microbiome testing. Our understanding on the microbiome has come a long way, and when in skilled hands, there is help for many who have been suffering and flailing around for years from one practitioner to another. With that said, it is still an inexact science. Even I can't read a report and determine for sure if a person has a given symptom or a given condition. Each of our microbiomes are unique. We all don't have the same bacteria, both in type and in quantity. But there are themes which are common to all of us. You see, there is a bit of a war in your gut for resources. There are universal or generally universal health-promoting bacteria. There are also opportunistic pathogens or bad actors. There are a number of other bacteria who may act in both directions, others who are simply happy to exist in a given environment, but yet don't determine your health, and others yet to be identified. When the environment favors a certain set of actors, they tend to prevail. So the goal is to take good care of this microbiome, this enormous ecosystem inside of you, so the good guys can prevail and the bad guys don't. When reading a report, I know what I'm looking for. The question is, does the report give it to me? Over thousands of hours of research, I've identified the keystone taxa and a variety of health conditions, along with the fuels needed to drive significant improvement. Many reports offer useless information that is not actionable. For example, years ago something called the FB ratio, or the Firmicutes bacteroidetes ratio, popped up in papers. This is useless information. They are both phyla, in other words, they encompass an enormous number of different species of bacteria. It's even silly to mention it. Here's an example of how stupid this is. Let's say you're a scientist and you're charged with monitoring a given ecosystem. And at the moment, what you're concerned about is the amount of ants in relation to the amount of the species, the giant anteater, which you're reintroducing into the wild. You ask a fellow scientist to conduct a survey of the ecosystem and report back to you on those two animals. But what he does, he provides a report on chordata and arthropoda. What? Chordata and Arthropoda? They're, they are phyla in the animal kingdom, just like Firmicutes and Bacteroides are phyla in the bacteria kingdom. So this report informs us about all animals with spinal cords, Chordata, in comparison to all insects, crustaceans, and millipedes, Arthropoda. What are you going to do with this information? Nothing. Why is this even in the reports? It's useless and unactionable. Another mostly unactionable report favorite is that of diversity. Typically, you'll see both alpha diversity and beta diversity listed. Alpha diversity simply tells us how many different species a microbiome has. It's useless because you can have a diverse, unhealthy microbiome. For example, most of the time I see reports for people who have terrible gastrointestinal symptoms, but yet they are told their alpha diversity is excellent. So think about that for a moment. You're a patient who has been suffering for years. You spend your good money on a report only to tell you that this valued thing called diversity is contradicting your symptoms. And if you're working with a practitioner, they're perplexed because their immediate knee-jerk reaction is that diversity is good. And they want to do what? Increase your diversity even more. Then there's beta diversity. Beta diversity is a comparison of how dissimilar you are as compared to a set of data. In our case, usually something established as healthy controls. So here at least we can say that your microbiome has a comparator. But how actionable is this information? The normal response to low diversity is to recommend eating a more diverse diet. Okay, but maybe the patient is already doing that. But does this help with their symptoms? And for those who are truly unwell, diet is not enough. In these people, significant environmental shift 
needs to happen through properly dosed and blended prebiotics. Another thing that drives me nuts about these reports is the level of reporting they offer. For our purposes, we start with the kingdom bacteria. Below that are a number of phyla, and this goes all the way down to species and strains. Now over the past 20 years or so, after thousands of human fecal microbiome studies, the data has become more and more precise. So why is a report offering, say, family level data? That's like saying I'm not sure if your pet is a wolf, a fox, a jackal, a coyote, or a dog. Some of the families within bacteria are enormous. Family level data is virtually useless. There are many potential different players within a family. Yes, they do often trend in one direction or another, but why not be more specific if possible? The only families I even consider noting are Enterobacteriaceae, which is a family full of bad actors, and two amazing health-promoting families shown here, Lachnospiraceae and Ruminococcaceae. But even they have exceptions. For example, within Lachnospiraceae, there is a species Ruminococcus navis, which is a known opportunistic pathogen, a bad guy. Or the family Ruminococcaceae contains Flavonifractor plaudii, which is a species with ugly data points. What I'm interested in is getting as precise as possible, but at the same time using enough data points to establish an adequate reference. For example, the gold standard of microbiome testing is shotgun metagenomics. It can tell you a tremendous amount of information about the microbiome. As for the bacteria, it goes all the way down to the strain level data. But the number of studies using shotgun metagenomics pales in comparison to 16S data which oftentimes only goes down to the genus data. And the older technology, PCR, only looks at a handful of suspect bacteria by using primers, not giving you information on a variety of other potential actors. But here's the good part. I've been through all the research going back 20 years, and all types of analysis tend to report the same themes. That certain bacteria are health-promoting all or most all the time, certain others are bad actors all or most all the time, and everything else falls somewhere in between depending on factors. So it helps when a report highlights the many taxa I've identified over the years down to the genus and species level. Now here's where a skeptic might say correlation does not equal causation. Well, yes and no. Take a look at this chart for Fecalibacterium prausitzii, the superhero of the gut. F. prausitzii is consistently, significantly higher in healthy controls, shown in green, a good thing as compared to the subjects from any given disease state or condition, shown in orange. There is no other taxon in the gut with data like this. It is statistically impossible that this is not a health promoter. I can go into why this is the case, but that's outside the scope of this presentation. For more on that, see my presentation on F. prausitzii. Likewise, there are other bacteria such as the species Ruminococcus navis, which I mentioned earlier which are absolutely proven opportunistic pathogens. The data points are ugly across the board, where the colors you see here are basically reversed. Now there are some exceptions. For example, Bifidobacterium is a health-promoting genus, but in Parkinson's disease, data shows that it metabolizes COMT inhibitors, which is a drug used to preserve levels of L-DOPA. Therefore, Bifidobacterium is consistently higher in Parkinson's subjects in trials versus healthy controls not because it's a root cause of Parkinson's, but because it's able to metabolize a popular Parkinson's drug. In other words, it's guilty by association. However, you still would not administer conventional probiotics because they can reduce levels of L-DOPA in Parkinson's. This is why you need an expert to help you through this process. Now, there is no precise definition of a healthy microbiome. Like I said, we all have a unique microbiome. However, we all share trends. The main bacterial players in the gut are the same from country to country. For example, the superstar of the gut, Fecalibacterium prausitzii, is a superstar in every country. The opportunistic pathogen, Ruminococcus navis, is a bad actor in every country. I know this slide is busy, but we're just going to follow the colors. Here we have data from 12 studies from around the world, which publish the most abundant taxa in their respective healthy controls. The taxa in green are the health promoters I have identified over the years. As you can see, they are prominent in healthy controls. The orange color represents the taxa I've identified as disease-promoting opportunistic pathogens. As you can see, they are less abundant in healthy controls from around the world. After years of experience in working with hundreds of reports and individuals, 
and reading all of the data, only a trained eye can truly help translate your report. For me, I look to the balance and abundance of the good actors as compared to the bad actors. There are always going to be bad actors in your gut. They are a normal part of your microbiome. The question is, are there sufficient good actors to keep them in check? If not, the bad actors do bad things, as their name implies, opportunistic pathogens. So when we talk about the microbiome and its effects on your health, we're talking about chronic issues. Oftentimes, patients feel that their symptoms must be attributed to something particularly nasty. It must be some nefarious parasite, some highly pathogenic bacteria, or some deadly virus. Although these are possibilities, the vast majority of the time, the root cause is something called dysbiosis, when the bad guys are in charge. They begin and continue a process of inflammation, which can have ramifications not only in your gut, but in every aspect of your health. You may find that statement hard to believe, but it's true. If you doubt me, join my microbiome university. Oftentimes, when a report talks about a given taxon, it only has one or a few references for their statement. Sometimes it's animal data they are referencing. I do not use animal data, as there is a significant difference between them and humans, as you can imagine. I use only human fecal microbiome data from the original research. To gain a proper perspective for the actors at play, it's important to read everything. And the reason why all the literature needs to be read is as follows. Let's say you read this paper. It shows you that in IBS subjects, the genus Roseburia was significantly higher versus the healthy controls. That might leave you the bad impression about Roseburia. And I've seen this incorrect judgment before. But when you take into account the rest of the IBS data, which shows significant differences for Roseburia, then you get the complete picture, which is almost all the time Roseburia is significantly higher in healthy controls as compared to IBS subjects and every other health concern. This method accounts for outliers in the data. And the good news is that you don't have to spend endless hours doing this because I've already done it. Now, when we're talking about research in your tests, we're usually talking about DNA. PCR just chooses a select handful of microbes, while both 16S and Shotgun are looking at the DNA of your whole microbiota. Looking at bacterial DNA is both valuable, but also has limitations. For example, when we're talking about short-chain fatty acids, microbiota DNA tells us the genetic potential of your microbiota to produce, say, butyrate or propionate, but does not measure the actual amounts produced. In other words, we can't be certain if all those genes are turned on or off, so to speak. Whereas actual fecal measurements of short-chain fatty acids do measure the quantities found, but there are large variations between individuals in absorption of short-chain fatty acids. So the percent that makes it to the feces in one person can be very different from another. Therefore, in this sense, measuring microbiota DNA might even be more accurate than fecal to assess butyrate production. When it comes to inflammatory markers such as fecal calprotectin, eosinophil protein X, or secretory IgA, these are human-derived markers and cannot be measured by 16S or shotgun metagenomics. However, even the labs that do measure them, I question the value. For example, if you tell me that you have diarrhea every day, along with other GI symptoms, I know you have an inflamed gut. I don't need to spend your valuable money on more lab work to tell you that you're inflamed. You already know that. So is a practitioner going to recommend to you some anti-inflammatories for your inflammation? The key to this is to get to the root cause. Whether a lab is showing me markers for inflammation, methane, beta-glucuronidase, or something else, these are hints into your microbiome. But what is the recommendation based on these? Take calcium D-glucurate, anti-inflammatories, or something else? You need to get to the root cause. Here's an example I've given for years. It's silly, but makes the point. Each day a man wakes up, grabs a hammer beside his bed, and whacks himself in the shin. He goes to the doctor and the doctor says, I can see the lesion on your shin and I can sense you're in pain. I'm going to prescribe you some pain medications. And if this continues, I'm going to recommend you for surgery. Of course, this is stupid, but it's actually largely how our system works. My approach is obvious. Stop hammering yourself in the shin and you'll heal. What's the root cause in the microbiome? It's the balance of bacteria. Once you control them, you control the environment. And all of these other measures of inflammation, metabolism, and so forth, they get rectified. Don't get lost in the weeds with the data. As complicated as the science of the microbiome is, the answers aren't. 
If you've been suffering from GI symptoms, especially if severe and of long duration, your doctor may recommend a colonoscopy to rule out several possibilities. But here's the thing. Most people I've interacted with have already been to see a number of doctors, done a number of labs and diagnostics to include colonoscopies, and they are still left without answers. In this case, a microbiome report may be of help. It's good to have more information to work with, so long as it's valid information. But in the end, we're probably talking about dysbiosis, which is something conventional doctors don't know about, and there is no standardized lab work to tell them that this is what you have. Hence, this testing industry. Which brings us full circle back to interpreting it, and if the information is of value. When you look at your report, is it a bunch of fancy sounding fluff that you don't understand? Is the data actionable? If there are recommendations, are they efficacious? If your practitioner is interpreting it for you, do they understand it? A report should be very simple. It should highlight the key players in the microbiota across many conditions and provide intelligent data-based recommendations. If you haven't done a microbiome analysis, you may not even need to do one. I've compiled all of the relevant data for the past 20 years and identified the average microbial fingerprint for a host of diseases slash health conditions. In addition, I've also done a meta-analysis for all of the main prebiotics in the marketplace, and I've identified which prebiotic is shown to influence which taxon. I rarely use probiotics, and when I do, it's not what you're accustomed to. I use precise blends of properly dosed and blended prebiotics to feed the proven health promoters who have names you've never heard of before, but you can learn more about in detail in my presentations. And what I do works. webinar for those with questions about the presentation of the week. So join now.